typed up this outline this morning. Wow. What um, so I, I got no idea what it says, so we'll see how we go. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> most of the time, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much most of the time uh, we do an outline. I've got no idea what it says anyway. So. Um, <laughs> Just, just go by uh, feel. <laughs> That's the way to go. <laughs> well, welcome again today. Yes. One thing I would like to do is just to ask you whether this doubling up of a weekend is uh, difficult for you to handle. Um, no? no? <laughs> okay. Um, because it, 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 if it is, we can change around the way we do that. Um, and is it okay having a couple of weeks between them, like, or is that idea, or do you, do you like longer between them? No. No. And um, obviously at some point we're going to outgrow the venue, because um, obviously it's getting to the point now where quite a number have to sit outside and everything. So, um, at, they want to. <laughs> they want to. <laughs> but, uh, I, Pretty soon we're going to have to actually look at finding some venues. So if any one of you know of some venues that are, can seat around 200 people or so, that are, that are, you know, by donation or some kind of way that we can uh, look after the venue that's in this region, if you could maybe email us at office at divinetruth.com and just let us know. So the, the email address I'll just write up. It's office at divinetruth.com um, So if you could just email us and let us know because obviously at some point in the next few months we probably have to have a different venue. I know lots of you love being here because it gives you a chance to walk around the garden. So, so thanks for Pete for that. Yeah. And, uh, and obviously uh, some of us have this emotion, and I think some of you probably have felt this emotion already, that, oh, it's quite nice while it's like it is, but if it gets a bit big, what's it going to be like then? So, but uh, that's how it goes. We want to get the truth out to everyone possible, so at some point it's going to grow, which isn't a bad thing. Although many of you think, well, it might be. <laughs> uh, it's a... A quality problem. It's a good problem. <laughs> it's the nature of things. Growth. If things don't grow, they die, generally. <laughs> all right, now do you all have an outline, those of you? Yep. All right, so um, Mary's, I think, still printing some, so she's got some at the back. If you put up your hand if you haven't got one. Uh, so there's just a few left who haven't got one. No worries. Keep your hand up until you get one. So you'll notice from the outline that the talk today is about laws governing our love of others. Now the reason why I wanted to discuss this subject with you is because what we're finding is a lot of people are doing some emotional processing work and once they start getting into this emotional processing work, they start having these feelings that uh, they can, they seem to have these feelings that they can pretty much project any emotion in anybody and get away with it and justifying it through the fact that they're processing their feelings, which is actually releasing something. And what I'd like to, and what the reason why we're covering a lot of these subjects now is we'd like to illustrate to you that that's actually not the case. If you process emotions, and in the process of dealing with different emotions, you purposefully or even unintentionally harm others in the process, right? what you're actually doing is also degrading your own soul condition. So, so we wanted to have a look at how we can process our emotions in such a way that we don't harm anybody or ourselves further. What I've found is that many have gone on the divine love path, started processing their emotions, and then they get to an emotion that's really quite intense, right? An emotion that's covered with a lot of rage or anger and quite intense in terms of its feelings underneath. They have quite a lot of fear, maybe, about that emotion. And so what they do then is they start projecting their anger and their fear around, but then justifying it as everybody else's law of attraction. 
like, I'm angry with you and it's your law of attraction. <laughs> right? That kind of justification. Now, when we justify our unlo own unloving behaviour, we're actually in quite a poor soul condition and we're degrading our soul condition quite rapidly, actually. And this is why I wanted to discuss this subject with you today, as to how to actually work your way through different emotions, bearing in mind the different laws. Now, there is just one thing you need to remember out of all of this. And that is, if you are humble, none of this would happen. Can I say that again? If we were really humble, we wouldn't need to be having this conversation. The reason why is that humility does something. Remember, the definition of humility is a burning desire or passion to feel and experience all of my own emotion. Right. So that's how I define humility. Now, remember that your emotion is a part of your soul. So when you have a burning desire or passion to experience, feel and experience all of your own emotion, you're actually having a burning desire or passion to experience your own self. <coughs> or you could say you are actually having a burning desire or passion to love yourself when you're in this state of humility. So this is what we could call humility. Now, if I am in a state of humility, I really don't need to know any laws governing my conduct with others. Can you see why? Because if I'm in this state, I'm always going to be owning all of my own emotions at every moment, and I'm never going to be projecting emotions onto other people. And so therefore, I'm in a state of love when it comes to my relationships with others. Can you see that? So it's quite simple, isn't it? So remember, the divine truth, the actual highest laws, are very, very simple to understand and grasp. Here, though it's not so easy sometimes to understand and grasp, but here, they're very simple to understand, but they're not easy to apply. To do actually, to do that, most of us have a large degree of difficulty. So while that's a very simple statement of what humility is and what humility means, to actually do it in practice is often so difficult that we get caught up in so many different really dark emotions that we finish up not practicing humility. And so we need to be reminded at times about the laws that involve our love of others. Now, remember yesterday, one of the things I said was that there were the lowest laws which were the ones to do with the physical and metaphysical. Remember that? The other things like the law of gravity, the law of aerodynamics, and a lot of things about your own body and how it works, and all of these other things are all part of the laws of the physical or the laws of the metaphysical. And remember I said to you that, you know, while many of us have a big wow factor with them when somebody can manipulate them, in the end, from God's perspective, they're not that important. And then remember I said that the next level of laws were the laws involving the morality or the, love, the laws of natural love. And the laws of natural love are far more important in your own practice, in your own life, than understanding the laws of metaphysics, for example. And in fact, once you perfect the laws of natural love, ironically, the metaphysics of your own body all become perfect as a part of the process. So in other words, once you perfect all of the laws of natural love, all of your chakras in your body will remain completely open at all times and your body will be able to regenerate and heal at any time. You won't ever get sick again and so forth. That automatically happens when you understand and practice all of the laws of natural love. Now remember I also said that there's the laws above that, which are the laws of divine love, which are the highest possible laws. But the process that we often follow when we're progressing is that we, we're coming from this place where we don't really understand love at all. I really don't know love <laughs> you know, at all. You know, that, that's the that's that's feeling we have, right? So we start off with this, I really don't know love at all, and I'm coming from this place of not really knowing love at all 
to this place where I'll be able to understand love completely. Firstly, understand natural love completely and then understand divine love completely, right? So when we're starting off at this place where we're not really understanding love at all and we're working towards this place where we'll eventually understand love completely, obviously we're going to make mistakes. And so we need to see how these mistakes affect us. So the purpose of today's discussion is to help you understand how the mistakes you have in practicing love actually affect you and what you can do to actually circumvent these things from occurring by basically practicing humility. So although it's not said in the outline, I wanted to state right at the beginning that if you practice humility, you will not need to understand the rest of our discussion today. But for the majority of us, we can't practice humility completely because the time when we do that is when we're at one with God. And until that time, we're learning even humility and how to practice that, which is this burning desire or passion to feel and experience all of our own emotions. So can you see how even the laws of divine love encompass so much? So this law of divine love and humility is one of the laws of divine love. It just encompasses so much in terms of natural love because that one law sort of gets rid of or throws out the need to understand like tens or fifteens or hundreds of, of natural love laws, right? But today what we'll be doing is going through some of these natural love laws so you can see the effect in your life. Sometimes too, understanding these natural love laws helps you a lot in seeing where you're out of harmony with God. Because a lot of times what we're doing is we're progressing towards God a bit and then we get to this place where we're in a stuck emotion, right? We're feeling quite stuck. And in that place, we don't often know why we're stuck. We don't often know why our relationship with God isn't improving. And it's often because we are breaking something or breaking some kind of law and not necessarily being aware of it that causes us to be in this place of stagnation. So it is sometimes good for us to understand what that law is and why we're breaking it and how it relates to our relationship with God. And hopefully our discussion today will help with that a bit as well. So this whole process of discussing the laws that govern your interrelationships and in particularly your relationships with others, and remember the next time we get together we'll be discussing your love of yourself, the laws that actually govern the love of yourself. And you'll actually find that the two sets of laws that govern both are the same. They're just applied differently, obviously, because one is the object of our love, somebody else, whereas the other is the object of our self-love, which is obviously ourselves. So what we want to do is illustrate both of them to you, and then what we'll do is we'll put it all together in the following discussion in terms of when we discuss relationships. So when we discuss romantic relationships, like how to actually have relationships that have love happening and what to do in relationships when things are going wrong. And you'll see all of these laws all just come out quite easily when you start examining relationships. However, even with all of that discussion, if you remind yourself of humility, you will never need to know or understand all of these other laws really. And that's something to just keep in mind. So that being said, what we're going to do is firstly just briefly describe the law. Now, each one of these laws I could spend four or five hours discussing with you. So obviously we're not going to be doing that. We're going to have a brief description of the law. We have a look at how it can be put into practice, how it affects yourself and others when you break it. And then we'll look at examples of what will go on with each one of these laws. That sound all right? And feel free to ask any questions about the laws as we go through. Now, I don't think we're going to be able to cover them all because uh, of the time constraints we'll have today. So um, there's quite a few pages of information that I've typed up uh, myself and Mary this morning. And, uh, and I, I can't see myself discussing it all. <laughs> After I've typed it up, I realise that that's probably the case. Um, but it was all there for your information anyway. And perhaps we'll elucidate more on it later. All right, so let's look at the first law. First law is the law of free will. Now, this is a very, very important law. It applies to all laws of God, in fact. 
It's, it is one of the higher set of laws, but it does govern the, the interaction we have with other people. What it means is that God has given you this gift, this gift of free will that is actually also given your neighbour and your enemy as well. And that is this gift to do anything you want. Whether it's harmonious with love or not. Right. Now many of us with this gift of free will, we go down this track of saying, well that didn't seem like a very wise thing for God to do, eh? Like, what if I want to do something bad or my neighbour wants to do something, what if my neighbour wants to kill me? You're saying that God is going to allow that? And the answer is, yes, yes. Because we have a law, this law of free will. The, there are consequences, remember, we learnt yesterday, if they do do it. But they do have the free will to make the choice to do it. Now, how does this law affect us in our relationship with others? So how will we treat others if we understand this law? Well, one of the first things we will do is we will always enable the other person's free will in all interactions with them. We'll never attempt to curtail another person's free will. We will never attempt to manipulate them or control them to do what we want. <coughs> right? Now, in, it sounds all nice in theory, right? But in practice, this also means that your young five-year-old, they don't want to clean their room, you need to enable their free will. <laughs> right? What do we do normally instead? What we would normally do is we would normally say, you clean your room or else, and if the or else is usually a, a patty or, a, or some kind of punishment where something is taken away from them. All right? Is that free will now? No. no, okay. So how do we handle this situation? Well, later we'll talk about the, the real way to handle the situation, the loving way. For the moment, if we're understanding the law of free will, can you see that we wouldn't be manipulating our children into cleaning their room, for example? May I state why? Because the reason why your child doesn't care for its environment is a lack of self-love. And in you asking them to clean their room, you're not addressing the underlying cause of the reason why their room's untidy. Their room's untidy because they don't never have enough care of themselves or enough care of their environment and it's a damaged emotion that actually came from you. <coughs> that they are actually triggering in you. Now, it could be that you are so ultra clean and so stressed out about being clean that that's the reason why they are being unclean. That's one of the reasons that it could be occurring. Or it could be that you were heavily manipulated by your parents and belted by your parents into making your room clean, so now you feel driven to be in the same manner with your child. Or, and when we get down to the real basis of it, it could be this, this issue that we do not love ourselves enough and therefore our child has not learnt to love itself enough <coughs> and because of that it maintains a dirty environment. But can you see, if I don't address the cause, and we'll talk about cause and effect in another dis discussion, and instead want to manipulate their free will, I've now broken a law in my love of my child. Can you see there's little fine points about lots of this, isn't there? So, so what will we do if we enable other people's free will is firstly we won't attempt to curtail their free will, but the second thing we'll try to do is always help them express their free will. So in a relationship, for example, if you know your husband or wife is stopping doing something they want to do because you want them to stop doing it, you are straight away out of harmony with the law of free will. And that, by the way, applies to any situation in a relationship. Now that's a fairly big ask too, isn't it, when we think about it. How many times do we get upset with our partner for not doing exactly what we wanted them to do? So, for example, you know, we go away for a weekend and our partner, if, partner, you know, the, if 
if we're a woman, we go away for the weekend and our partner who's a male, he just decides for the whole weekend he's going to get takeout and he just leaves all the stuff all over the place. And then Friday, Sunday night we come home, you know, from a lovely holiday out with the girls perhaps, and then we come home and look at that mess. Like there's just this mess there and he's just like sitting in front of the telly drinking his beer and eating the last of the Chinese that, that he just polished off. And uh, everything's a mess. Now that's his free will. He, in action. Yay. <laughs> I'm not agreeing with his free will. I'm just agreeing with his right to express it like that. So he's allowed to express that. Now, now, your free will is that you don't have to tidy up. If you're the woman coming home. Um, but you may want to deal with some issues of a lack of love that he has for you in the process. Certainly. But you wouldn't be trying to force him to not do things that he's already chosen to do. And you wouldn't even get upset with him doing it, right, if you were in a space of love. Mind you, you might not stick around for very long if you continued doing it. And we'll talk about your own self-love as a part of that process the next time we get together. But it's an expression of his free will. He's, he is allowed to do this. Right? Let's even take it further. Let's say you lived in a country, a war-torn country, and some soldiers came into your house, took your children away and shot them. Right. That's their free will in action. And you would not curtail their free will if you applied this law. And that's a pretty big ask now, isn't it? Like, that's starting to get... Are there any exceptions? No. Why would there be an exception? Wouldn't that be your free will to uh, We need to do mics with questions because otherwise they won't get on the sound. Wouldn't it be your free will to protect your children in that case? Of course, but you'll be breaking a law of harming their free will. So what do you do? What do you do? Can you see how how love in action is very, very different to love in speak, you know. We speak about it, and it's very, very different to our actions. Jeanette, thanks. AJ, in that situation, mm -hmm. could you not plead with them to change their minds? Certainly. Oh, no. Certainly. That would be appropriate. Certainly. It would be appropriate for the, to plead with them to change their mind. But it wouldn't be appropriate to get out a knife or a gun and shoot them to prevent them from doing it because you'll be breaking their free will now. Now that, when you say things like that, that's pretty hard, isn't it, like, to, to actually put into practice most people would feel. But this is the truth of what I'm talking to you about. Now, if you really trusted God and you really trusted all of God's laws, you would have very little fear about the event. Why is that? Because in the end you'd know that there is no such thing as death you know, um, and they have experienced very little pain in dying, in this case that I've just given you. And so you would actually feel, and in fact you will get to the point where you would actually feel compassion for the people who are doing it. But that is going to require a lot of love, isn't it, from you? And a lot of practicing forgiveness and a lot of those kind of qualities. Now that's how far God takes free will. Because some of God's children die because of the free will being exercised by others of God's children. And God feels the same about that. Just like you would if one of your children attacked another of your children. God feels the same as, as you do, well I would say even more loving than you do, <laughs> about that situation. And that's how far God wants us to take this law of free will and practice it. Can you see that if everyone did it, we would have a utopian existence on this planet, wouldn't we? If everyone did it, that would mean that the man who came in to murder the children wouldn't be able to murder them either, would, would he? He wouldn't even be able to walk in the door without knocking first and asking to come in, <laughs> would he? If he was practicing it. And if everybody on the planet practiced it, then there'd be utopia on this earth in terms of a peaceful relationship between every country and every individual. Just that law of free will, nothing else. 
That's how powerful the law is if it's, if it's actually practiced. But it requires, unfortunately, on the earth, it requires a group of people practicing it first. And that's where most of us come unstuck because we want justice, don't we? So in a situation where we talk about just now, most of us would want justice. We want, we'd want to go into their house and kill their children and see how they feel about that, perhaps. That's what happens, isn't it, in war in the end? Isn't that how a war is, really? And it's all because we don't respect each other's free will, really. If I respect your free will completely, even if you kill me, I would still respect your free will completely. So that's a fairly big ask, isn't it? But this is one of the laws of loving others. That also means that I wouldn't be projecting anger and rage at another person for anything that they have done. Because if I'm in a state where I respect their free will, I would respect the fact that they're allowed to do that, whatever they have done, and I need to own my emotions. I don't have to be around them, of course. If I own my own emotions and feel all of my own emotions, I won't even feel a feeling of rage towards them. I'd feel a feeling of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a very powerful emotion. You've all heard of that uh, man in Hawaii, I think it was, in a... Sorry? Yep. Can, you, what, can somebody say it into a microphone so we can actually... Dr. Hugh Lin, yep. it's Ho Apono Apono. Yep, and he was forgiving um, <coughs> patients in the psychiatry ward. And actually, unbeknown to him, he was actually forgiving spirits with these patients who, mo who were pushing these patients into most of their actions. And just the act of forgiving these spirits, which he was doing even unknowingly, the act of forgiving the spirit who was driving the patient to do things uh, that, were, that, that were evil in nature, um, the act of forgiving the spirit caused the spirit and the patient to disconnect from each other and the spirit to be able to move on so the patient could move on. And in fact, he cleared out most of the warts from their patients. Just the act of forgiving. The process is actually cle clearing your own thoughts. In other words, it starts from your own thoughts and that's what you're actually forgiving as well. Yeah, clearing that, uh, forgiving that thing within yourself. We, we can t when we talk about forgiveness, which is another discussion, we'll talk about that principle. But if we talk about it from a purely sort of action point of view here, the law of free will is a very, very powerful law in that what it allows is for you to act in harmony with everyone else's free will around you. And in fact, you will enable everyone's free will. The only time when you will not actively enable their free will, when I say actively enable them, actively support their free will, is when they're doing things that harm other people's free will. So let's say you decided to harm, let's say, Ken, you decided to harm Hiroko. What I would do, I wouldn't support your harming of Hiroko, I would support your right to harm her if that's what you want to do, but I would plead with you to not do it, right? Because I also support her right to have her free will. Does that make sense? And so we would do that in regard to this law of free will. So that's why it's appropriate, as you pointed out, Jeanette, to plead with the person who's harming or, or wanting to kill our children, for example. And it's rare that it actually has any effect on the person if they are in a terrible state or condition, um, but that there are results to that in terms of the law of compensation for that person. And when we understand the law, even the law of compensation, we will start to see, in fact, that everything that God has is perfectly organised to correct that person who's harming another free will anyway. And I will just do whatever I can to assist that process. So can you see how the love of others here is influenced? You think of all the times in the past where you have tried to manipulate somebody else's free will. You know they didn't want to do something and yet you got them to do it. Through coercion, if it's a child, through punishment or through withdrawal of love. How did you, how, how did you manipulate their free will? Every time we did that, we actually broke a law of love. Uh -huh. 
Is it breaking a law of love to do thing like to do things short of um, of harming the person, like a hostage situation, trying to you know get people out, that kind of thing? Look, I'm struggling with this. <laughs> um, can you elucidate a little further? Um, with a hostage situation where um, somebody was able to distract the people's attention away or even manipulate them in a way that allowed other people to get out because like short of shooting them or harming them I can understand it's you know that's breaking a law but I'm thinking of situations where some you know somebody is impacting on other people's free will um, where pleading may not change the situation but there may be ways that you can assist people to get out or to change that action that's impacting on their free will? Certainly. Uh, let me give you an example of that in the Through the Mists book. Um, many of you have read that now, have you? The Through the Mists book. The way that Afra entered the spirit world, this man Frederick, whose name was on earth, was that he developed in himself his desire to help others so much that when he saw a galloping... Um, horse uh, carriage going towards the child and going to run over the child he ran without thinking to pick up the child and get it out of harm's way right. so that was certainly an act where he exercised his free will in harmony with love they both died he died as well as the child yeah. and they both arrived in the spirit world in good fairly good condition him because his, his last act of his life was actually trying to save another person. But you wouldn't try to save another person by breaking a law of God. Right? So he didn't try to save the person by breaking a law of God. He just, without thought, wanted to get the person out of harm's way. He didn't try to put himself in harm's way. He didn't even think about it. He just felt this feeling of love with mo which motivated him to do what he did. Does that make sense? And certainly we can do that at any time. The key is to feel your emotions in each case and feel where your, uh, is your emotions driven by fear or are they driven by love? Remember, every time they're driven by fear, there's an emotion inside of you that's disharmonious with love. So if I'm driven by fear, the fear is that in a hostage situation, I'll, we'll all die, but some of us have got to get out, and I'm driven by that fear, then obviously I'm now out of harmony with love anyway. If I'm driven by love, then it's a different matter altogether. The key is that love, if love becomes such a, a, a close part of, into your heart, you won't even need to make a decision in the situation. You will just be automatically drawn into action based on love. Does that make sense to everyone? Just like Afra was automatically drawn into action of saving the child without thinking. That's how we will be. You, you hear a lot things like, you know, um, a person walking down the street and then somebody mugging them or somebody beating them and nobody ever steps in like they all just watch will that be would that be loving would that would it be loving to say oh, that's their free will you know that's their law of attraction I'll sit back and watch because it's not validating the free will of the person being harmed is it so I would certainly go up and muddy my nose in the situation um, even if it meant the person actually attacking myself. Right? I wouldn't try to defend myself or defend the person, but I would certainly go up to them and try to appeal to them in some way to stop what they're doing. Does that make sense? Of course, as everybody practices it, none of those events would ever occur. So that's the other consideration we need to make. So can you see how the law of free will affects our relationships? Can you see that? So in your love of others, ask yourself the question, do I enable their free will? Or am I actually trying to curtail their free will, control their free will? Am I trying to manipulate them uh, because of a fear that I have or because of some emotions that I'm denying within myself? Right. Ask yourself those questions. And if you ask yourself those questions, the emotions that drive you to not respect another person's free will will be exposed. Now, what might some of those emotions be? What, what would um, some emotions be that you would have inside of yourself that would cause you to not respect another person's free will, do you think? Like, for example, with a child. 
If you're a parent, what would one of the feelings be inside of you as a child? Let's say you get the child's got a dirty room. What's the emotion in the parent? Why does the emotion want to make the child clean the room? So what 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 would that be? And we have to use our mic here. Sorry, but so uh, Linda, thanks. The emotion within the parent. Um, for me, it was about um, not loving myself, control. The feeling you you were being controlled. Um, no, my, I just felt really dirty. Right, unclean, like unclean, yeah. and because I just went through this whole experience with my elder do eldest daughter. Yeah. Um, yeah, just. Did and, you feel like you were a bad mum as well, like? For the room not being no, yeah, if you I had knew visitors it, come. Okay. No, I, no, I knew it was my emotion, and I just felt like I wanted it to be clean, so I felt better myself. I right. felt clean, and and then I realised it was just no self love, no yeah. no self worth that I had that okay. my daughter was showing me. So you connected with some unworthy emotions inside of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't help. Yeah. Didn't. Yeah, she didn't clean the room. It took about six weeks and it was just building up, building up. And I felt a lot of sorrow and grief that, yeah, I felt so... So did she get to a point where she cleaned it by herself? I gently encouraged her, yeah. I thought. Yeah. Um, I sort of offered to, you know, to help her a little bit. Yep. Um, yeah, she did. I, I, I still had to encourage her, but I wasn't angry. It was more just encouragement. And yep. um, she did. And Okay, can I, can I illustrate something that I've done with a person with this issue? Um, there was a friend of mine who, who never washed very often and, and he never w used any deodorant or anything like that either and he never really washed his clothes very often either, right? So, so when you went up to him, like, he, he smelt of bad odour quite a lot, right? Someone's quite distressed. <laughs> he smelled of bad odour quite a lot. So you go up to him and you know you go to hug him and there's this, it's just, oh, it's so powerful. Like, this is, it brings tears to your eyes, you know. Like, <laughs> and uh, and so it was very hard to actually, you know, have an expression of love towards him, you know. And you know he would stay at somebody's house or my house sometimes and. And the room would always be a mess. Like you open the door, and like there'd be all of his clothes. He'd be travelling from overseas, and all of his clothes would be strewn over the floor, and and the bed would be really untidy. And you walk in, and it smelt really bad of all the bad odour, you know. And and it, you know it was just like this was your room in your house. Imagine, and this is what it smells like, right? Now. Most people would just not know what to do under those circumstances, would they? Like, do we put up with him staying for another week or do we ask him to move or <laughs> what do we do? You know, like, this is really uncomfortable. I you know, don't know what to do. So what I did was I, I realised that the big problem that he was having was this personal issue of love of self. Because if you, if, you if you don't love yourself, you don't care about what you smell like. You don't care about what you eat. You don't care about your environment, your room. You don't care about your clothes. And so what we did is we sat down and had a discussion about how much he felt um, unworthy and unworthy to love himself, like how much lack of love of self he had. For the next two days, he cried. Like every, For the next two days, in between occasional eating, he cried about it. And then the day after that, he just went and cleaned his room he got all of his clothes, put them in disinfectant and <laughs> in the washing machine, and got all the smell, the bad odor smells, and went and bought some deodorant that was actually good for you know, good for his body. You know, not the aluminium spray things, but the actual stuff that, that doesn't harm you. And and started using that straight away. It was just like amazing, the transformation after he had a good cry about how unworthy and how bad he felt about himself. He realised in the end of all that that he was using it to keep people away from him. That he was actually using it to prevent closeness because he felt he was so unworthy to have people being close to him that the best way to prevent closeness without saying a word would be to smell bad 
and nobody wants to come near you. That's the emotion that he eventually worked through. But in the end, we could have actually harmed his free will. We could have said, you're not staying here another day until you clean up this room. <laughs> Couldn't we? That's one thing we could have done. And we might have felt justified in doing that. We could have said, I'm never giving you a hug again. <laughs> you just smell too bad to hug. <laughs> we could have done that too. And notice that if we'd done that, it would never have addressed the emotion, but it also would have been harming his free will, which would have also meant that my own soul condition would have degraded. Can you see that? But we had to be brave enough to say the truth to him too. See? I know you said you had to be brave enough to tell the truth, but how did you actually start the conversation off? I just, I just said uh, to him, um, I won't use his name, but I just said to him that one thing I've noticed is that you, have a, you, you, you don't have very much love of yourself. And he, he sort of goes, oh, oh, okay. And I said, well, can I tell you why, how I've noticed that? And then I listed all of the things, and I was very specific. About, about how bad he smelt and about how bad his clothes smelt and about how untidy his room was. And then I focused him back on the fact that it wasn't anything to do with that, but it was to do with the love of self. Do you see? Focused him on the cause. We'll talk in a minute about another law, the law of cause and effect. And if you're loving with others, you will actually help other people address the cause. You won't ever deal with the effects. Right? So it applies, this applies with your own interaction with a child who's got an untidy room. Dealing with the effect is the untidy room. Dealing with the cause is addressing why does this person have the untidy room? What's the underlying emotional condition or reason why this person acts in the manner they do? And you will help them find that emotion if you love them. Does that make sense? If we can have the mic over here. There's, there's another mic somewhere. No, it's coming. Is it, there's another mic somewhere? Yeah, I've got one here. Oh, yeah. So, that's a great job. Every time I get out, she's done. Ah, maybe you don't want to do it as much. <laughs> Are there any times when um, treating the effect rather than the cause can help the cause? No. Ever. And God never, ever, ever addresses, issue, addresses effects of issues. And we'll talk about that in a minute when we deal with the law itself. Yeah. So, getting back to the free will thing, we are often very, very tempted to harm other people's free will in our interactions with them. And most of us have no even consideration that we're doing it in many, many times. And, and if you allow yourself to analyse your life a bit, you will actually see a whole group of emotions in you that cause you to do it. Now, it even gets so fine as to do this. Let's say... You feel anger inside of yourself whenever a person does something that you don't like. You never express it. You never yell at them. You might withdraw from it a little. But the other person, from an intellectual perspective, knows nothing at all that you feel the way you feel. Now, if they were sensitive at the soul level, they'd feel this bombardment of anger and rage from you. And if they're sensitive at the soul level, they will actually change what they do. Now, this is how many parents control children, unknowingly. By actually feeling this anger and rage come up with inside of you, a very, very sensitive child will automatically change their behaviour, even though you have not expressed verbally any of that anger or rage that's inside of you. They will automatically change their behaviour. And you are curtailing their free will. That's the whole purpose of anger and rage, in fact. Isn't it? Isn't the purpose of anger and rage a way to get away from, you know, to, to actually control the other person, to give you back what you want from them? It's all to do with what you were expecting. So can you see that there's a lot of things, that, and I've listed some other examples there. Um, like with our friend, I feel lonely or sick or desperate, so I need my friend to come to me. It doesn't matter what my friend's doing in their life, they've got to come to me. If they don't come to me, they are not my friend anymore. 
And that is not respecting the other person's free will. Can you see that? <coughs> There's so many things we do like that in our day-to-day -day situation and we need to bear in mind what is actually happening. Alright, so what's the next law? The law of passion and desire. Now this is very linked to the law of free will in that I'm allowed to desire or want anything I want. And in fact, when I do have this desire, it instantly creates everything around me. If my desire is disharmonious with love, it will create a heap of disharmonious results of which I'll feel the painful experience of. If my desire is harmonious with love, it will create a heap of harmonious results which my, my heart will leap with joy that I've just created about. But either way, this law of desire exists. Every single one of you, and myself of course, need to learn how to practice the law of desire. Learn how to live in our desires and passions. So, what do we do here in our relationship with others? We enable other people to live in their passions and desires. So, imagine I'm, an, I'm now a parent again, and I've got my teenage son. I want my teenage son to go to uni. My teenage son wants to drive around in a car for two or three years and surf. Right? What will I do? If I obey the law of desire and the law of free will, I will actually enable him to do it. He's not harming himself or anyone else, is he? Well, we will think so often, won't we? We will often think, well, he's harming himself. That's the time he's got to go to uni. He's got no other time to do that. What's going to happen with the rest of his life? And what are we now expressing? All of our fears, okay? So we're imposing all of our fears upon him. And what do you think he's going to do with his desire? It gets shut down, doesn't it? Now, how many of you, when you're asked, what's your passions and desires, you don't even know them yet? Why? Because but when we were little, this happened to us. We were shut down, shut down, shut down by our environment and our upbringing that now we have no idea really what we really want at all. And it's such a sad thing because the law of desire is about creation. Everything around you gets created by what you are passionately desiring. Right? I was interested overseas, I had this experience overseas, I was living with a family for a couple of days and, and it's interesting travelling around and staying with people, right? Uh, because often it, what happens is we have interactions and they start learning the principles of divine truth in practice, right? What happened was that the daughter, she was, uh, I think she was about 12 at the time, she um, wanted to have a horse. <laughs> we're, we're talking about Texas in the middle of a city, Dallas and the girl wants to have a horse. Huh? And she exercised her desire. She longed for this horse. She wanted to have a horse. She found a friend who actually, whose parents had a horse, um, I don't know what you call them, some stables and, and all of those kind of things. And she went, along, she went along to that and she groomed the horses. Every weekend she went there to groom a horse and whatever. She wanted, her, wanted somebody to give her a horse. She would pester her dad about a horse. He'd say, no, no, you're not having a horse. You know, we've got to buy food for it. We've got to do this for it. No, no, you can't have the horse, right? Anyway, she got given a horse. And the people who she was working for wanted her to actually keep the horse there. And all she had to do was earn enough money to actually pay for its food. So she went to her mum and dad for approval. And they told her she couldn't have it. And yet her law of desire, her creation, was that she'd already created that she's got it. And yet the whole process got shut down. Isn't that interesting? Because of the fears of the parents and what that might create and so forth. So it's really interesting what happens with this law of desire if we don't enable it in other people, in particularly our children, but in everyone around us. <coughs> Every time you try to stop somebody from doing what they really want, you are breaking the law. So that means that every time your child has been suppressed a little with their desires, you've broken the law. 
every time your partner wanted to play golf and you didn't want him to go, you suppressed his desire and broke the law. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you go off for a little holiday for a couple of days and you wanted to stay home and look after you, you broke the law. You would actually enable the desire of your partner or your children or in fact your friends or anyone around you. And the opposite is also true. When you realise the person is not acting in harmony with their true desire, you will actually talk to them about it. And if they're doing something for you, you would actually refuse to accept it. I'll give you another illustration. I went out to dinner with a group of people. There were four, there were three women and myself who went out to dinner. This was overseas again. And uh, I'd paid for the previous two or three meals in a row that we'd all gone out together. And the feeling in all of the women that were with me in this time was that one of them had to pay. That was the feeling they had. One of them had to pay for the meal. So one of them nominated she was going to pay for the meal and I told her that, no, I'm sorry, but I am going to pay for the meal. And I actually got up there and then and just went and paid for the meal. I didn't ask for her approval. <laughs> then I came back and sat down and she was really angry with me and told me, and said, you know, why did you do that? You just harmed my free will. I said, I'm sorry, I didn't harm your free will actually. Your free will was that you didn't want to pay for the meal. All right? The feeling I got from you and everyone else here was that none of you wanted to pay for the meal. That's why none of you got up and did it. The only person who actually wanted to do it was myself, so I got up and did it. <laughs> so I never harmed your free will at all. Because, see, the free will happens at the soul level or the emotional level, not at what you think. Can you see? You see, why often we think that we want to do something or we thought that we were going to do something and really we didn't want to. How many times have you sat down with a group of people, people who have invited you out to dinner and then you've realised three quarters of the way through the meal that they actually invited you but you're going to have to pay for yourself. Like, because none of them want to exercise their free will to give you the gift of paying for your meal. Has that ever happened to you? Like, when you've gone out? Like, you often see these couples go out and one couple pays for their half and the other couple pays for their half. Fair enough. But how much of it is because of their fears? No one wants to desire to actually do something as a gift for someone else. Like, often that happens. All desires and free will operations and all of these other things I'm talking about all happen at the soul level. That is why they affect your soul condition. Remember we've talked a lot about soul condition, haven't we? Particularly in the mediumship classes and that that we've been doing. We talked a lot about soul condition because soul condition is what attracts everything. So this law of desire and the law of free will, when you break them, it affects your own soul condition. When you, in, when you live by them, it actually enables everyone around you and your own soul condition to grow. That's the beauty of it. So if you were out with a meal and you were afraid to pay, what's the best thing for you to do? Exercise a desire, pay, and let this emotion of a lack of abundance be triggered in you. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Just do it. Like, that's... You'll find the desire of free will and release of that emotion and bang, all of a sudden you'll start having some abundance. And you'll be able to do it more often. Right? Everything operates upon the soul. So that's the law of desire. You notice some other examples I've given there. Of our children don't want to do what we want them to do for us. You want to ask a question? Oh, you need to flick it on. Right up. That's it. Um, I'd just like to ask a question about when people constantly like to give but sometimes can't receive. So they feel the need to be able to give because that's where they're at. Their action is quite, is, is quite selfish actually. The reason why they're giving is because they want to actually get an emotion in return back to them. And so their, their motive for giving if they can't receive is actually quite distorted. It's not a loving motive and they need to have a look at that. We'll talk about that when we talk about love of self. So a person who's constantly giving, and we'll also talk about, there's a section when we go, I think it's down in the, 
which bit was it, babe? Was it the law of, of natural love, wasn't it? Laws of natural love or something. There was a section anyway that we came up with this morning <laughs> that covers that uh, particular scenario where a person's always giving, always giving, always giving, but actually it's not coming from a desire. It's not coming from a sincere desire it's be- or a passion. It's actually coming from an emotional injury of what they get in return when they do give. So that certainly is not loving. Yeah. Ken, thanks. Qu- uh, need a microphone. Um, for a partner to follow her or his, his or her dream or desire, would supporting or encouraging your partner, male or female, be in a loving... Um, um, would be a loving act. Yeah. Yeah, certainly, except if you're actually suppressing your own desires in order to do it. Does that make sense? So, so if uh, Mary wants to do something, I will s- totally support her desire to do it. However, if what she wants to do means that I've got to suppress my own desire to please her, then I wouldn't be able to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And that talks, and that's why we have the next discussion about love of self, because that's about a love of self issue. In fact, what happens with all of these laws is that you will have exact the exact balance that you treat the other person in the exact manner you wish to be treated yourself. Right. So, so this is where most of, uh, and that's called the golden rule, by by the way, that I said in the first century. Um, if you would treat other people in the way you wish to be treated, not, not the way you get treated, <laughs> the way you wish to be treated. Do you understand the difference? Like, quite often we get treated in a certain way and so we feel like, hmm, another way back and we're in that law. That's not the case. It's the way we wish to be treated ourselves. So, so just like you wish to have your own desires fulfilled, you would also wish for your partner to have all of their own desires fulfilled. Now, a lot of people worry about that because they think, oh, well, what if our two desires are totally opposite to each other and we just go apart? Well, if you grow apart, then it's highly unlikely your soulmates for a start in doing what you desire. Because when you do what you desire, generally what happens is the soulmates get drawn together. As long as they deal with their emotional injuries in the process, they feel drawn together by their desire, not pulled apart by their desire. The truth is, too, that if you, everyone is loving in a relationship, you can't be pulled apart by one of you exercising a desire. Yeah. Um, and when I say exercise a desire, exercise a desire in a pure manner. You can't ever be pulled apart in terms of unloving with somebody. What I mean by that is that, let's say one of the partner realises that they don't desire the person they're with anymore. That they actually desire Joe Bloggs down the road, right? That's who they desire to live with from now on. Now that's a pretty hard situation, isn't it? To enable their desire. Well, you might love them, right? And yet, the loving thing to do would be to actually enable their desire. Now, it would be unloving for them to go and have an affair and not tell you. Certainly, that would be an unloving act. But even then, they have the free will to do that and if I'm angry about it, I've got some emotions to deal with. Right? But if they come and say, look, the truth is I don't love you anymore and the truth is that I feel like I, I, I'm falling in love with this person here, you would actually enable their desire. And that's pretty confronting, isn't it? Instead of spitting and you know, <laughs> complaining and going with the girlfriends or boyfriends and having a session <laughs> where we complain about our partner and so forth, we will actually enable their desire. Because love would do that. And love would also, if I was humble, deal with all of my emotions that that creates in me of being rejected and not wanted anymore and all these other feelings <coughs> that I need to do it to be loving to the person. Okay. Kim, thank you. At the back. Uh, thank you. I have a situation, I've, I've had this, where... Um, the person I'm around is the give, give, you know, the giver constantly. Doesn't like to receive, yeah. hates receiving. Yeah. And I go, damn it, you're going to receive. <laughs> and I push it on them. Yeah. And I'm nice, and I try, and I give, and I, and I can feel this, um, 
you know, the imposition of it. But yeah, I don't know whether I, what I'm doing really. In all yeah, no, that's out of harmony with love too. Mm. If the person doesn't want to receive, the best thing to do would be firstly talk to them about why they don't wish to receive and do they want to confront the emotion. And if they do, then you might enter into some giving and seeing how they go confronting the emotion. But you wouldn't force them into receiving. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, I struggle because I feel that's a cop-out and I feel this need to force it on. Well, yes, it is a cop-out on their behalf, yeah. but why do you feel like you can control their cop-out? Mm. That's the issue that's that you have. Issue. Yeah. So, you. so the key is to work your way through that issue, but it's a good point, Kim. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so everyone understand how the law of desire works in our relationships? We enable the desires in others and we let them do what they desire. In fact, we encourage them to do what they desire. If you really desire it, please do it. If you really desire to leave me and go with that man, go for it. I'm going to own all my emotions about that. It's fairly hard in some situations to do, isn't it? Owning the emotions. But remember, there are emotions in you that would be, if you're acting angrily or whatever, that would be being suppressed by you uh, in that situation. Right, what's next? What law is next? Law of cause and effect. This is basically the law, what you sow, you reap. In other words, everything that you create has a cause within your own soul condition that created it. Right? And anything, any action you take has a cause within itself. And that action will actually create other effects even. Can you see how that works, the law? A pretty basic explanation. We can talk about it in detail at another time. How does this affect our love relationships? How do you reckon? You see, if I, if I understand that every cause for another person, everything that happens to the other person or every effect that of their life is driven by some cause within themselves, then what will I help them address? Cause. I won't help them address the effect. In fact, it would be highly unloving for me to help them address the effect. Can you see why? If I address the effect, then I'm not actually helping them deal with the cause. The cause is still in them and it's going to create the effect again. And again. And again. And again. And I'm going to be bailing them out each time because they're not dealing with the cause. So this happens a lot with our friendships and our family relationships and our, even our partnerships generally. We're often trying to bail out our partner or bail out particularly our children we do this with, right? Where we're bailing them out of the effects of their life rather than dealing with the underlying causes. Jerry? Um, I've got a 17 year old daughter. Um, finished up a relationship with a boyfriend um, somewhere in the past where I've heard you say that uh, again you don't deal with the effects and uh, you know this thing uh, tapping them and say it'll be okay um, when you've got a daughter and she's boring her head off you know y is it okay I w I w what I automatically did is naturally she's crying you you say it'll be alright and then you start dealing with the cause but you know what I mean or because otherwise, I, I don't know how I can um, just withdraw and say, no, well, you cry over there and then I'll deal with the cause when you're ready sort of thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. I, mean, I, yeah. I love my daughter. I just, I, you know. You're asking, what's the loving way in which to be that you know, I mean, law? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's the way I'm looking at it. I said, yeah, okay, we'll deal with her emotions or her feelings at the moment and she's expressing them through. Right. It's through highly time. appropriate to hug a person while they're crying if the person is owning their causal emotion. It's highly inappropriate to hug a person while they're crying while they're projecting an emotion of self-denial or self-deception upon you. So what are you feeling from them? Are they actually owning the emotion? And this is where you need to be sensitive to your own feelings. Does that make sense? Are they actually owning their emotions or are they actually denying an emotion? 
Now, if you're owning your emotions or denying your emotions, obviously it's going to be very difficult to, if you're denying your emotions, to actually understand whether they're denying their emotions or not. And this is why it's so important to actually work through your own emotional issues first when you're helping others. However, in the example you gave, so your daughter's crying about her boyfriend and the breakup. Is that the causal emotion? No. Okay. No. Right? It's not the causal emotion. Why isn't it the causal emotion? The causal emotion is probably an emotion of being rejected, isn't it? Or something like that. If she had a good sense of self-worth, she would be enabling her boyfriend's desire to go off with somebody else. Would she not? So therefore, she is actually crying about something, but... It, but she's not connecting with the causal emotion. So let her cry, let her cry and let her cry or how long she wants to cry. She might want to cry for two days, so let her cry for two days and give her the hug she needs, whatever. But also say at some point, actually what you're crying about isn't the real problem. And I'd be happy to talk to you about the real problem when you're ready. Right. Now, if she continued crying for another month about this problem, would you now cook for her, clean for her, wash her clothes, get her off to school, you know, get her off to uni if she's going to uni, and do all of that for her, if you're addressing the cause? See, most of us would be tempted to do that, saying, oh, but she's really upset and I need to do that. Uh, I, would, I would not do that. Uh, what I would say to her is actually you're not addressing the cause and I'm not going to help you address the effect. <laughs> I'm perfectly happy for you to address the effect yourself if that's what you want. I'm not going to make changes to my life to help you address the effect because it's totally out of harmony with love of myself. I can only lo love myself in this situation if I help you address the cause. Right? And so I do that with my daughter. So I'm not saying don't hug her, but if you're hugging her for a month and you're only dealing with effects, then you're actually enabling her to stay where she is. And this happens all the time, you know. Like, how many times have one of you had a friend who has been maybe abused by their husband or wife or, you know, whatever, constantly, and yet, you know, they stay in that situation for years and you're the one who they call on every time a big blow-up occurs. Right? That's very damaging for them to, for you to support that all the time because they're not addressing the cause. They don't want to address the cause. The cause is their lack of self-love. That's the cause. They need to look at that cause. And, and if you help them address the effect, you're not helping them address the cause. Very damaging to them. Like, all of man's laws are mostly about effects, aren't they? You know, we get this, like, law Bibles, you know, like, you know, no lawyer has ever read them because they only read them by case history or whatever to apply to a case. No one really knows what the whole lot of them say because they're made by a group of people, like a large group of people. But there's literally like rows and rows and rows of taxation law, you know, law, common law, and all these different laws. There's, you know, your country, my country, has this group of laws. I've got nothing, no idea of what they are. None whatsoever. And I don't feel that many of you would know either what they are, right? And so, what, is that, what are those laws mostly created to do? They're mostly created to deal with the effect. So they are totally useless. <laughs> Understand from God's point of view, anything that deals with an effect is totally useless. They charge a lot of money. Yeah, but they're still totally useless. <laughs> Can you go through a causal if effect not knowing it can you go through um, your causal emotion without knowing it actually unconsciously in a way uh, um, you can sort of process many emotions without really understanding that you just processed an emotion the key the key is when you process causal emotions your life changes automatically without you having to try to do anything different does that make sense yeah so that's, that's often what happens. You feel the need to change your life and you do it, but, but you're not, it's not something you have to write down and say, oh, you know, it's not like affirmations, you know. I must lose weight, I must lose weight, you know. That kind of thing is not dealing with the cause, it's dealing with an effect. 
an affirmation doesn't address causal issues. But allow you, when you allow yourself to deal with causes, sometimes the cause will be dealt with and you didn't even realise it was dealt with and now your actions have changed. And you don't really know why, but it's great when it has. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Yeah. You will at some point in your own soul develop know what's actually happened in each case. Now, what happens when, in our relationships, what, what, what's the results of breaking the law? Well, if you look at the list that I've given you there, you notice one of the results is we, f we end up doing things for other people so much that we become tired and exhausted and depleted emotionally and depleted spiritually and depleted energetically when we're doing all of this. So if that's what's happening in your life, you're feeling tired and exhausted by helping somebody or helping some, somebody else or other people, then <coughs> you are not helping other people deal with the, with the causes of their problems. You are actually addressing the effects of their problems. Right? And that is a very tiring and thankless proposition, which is the penalty for not addressing the cause, by the way. So the penalty for not addressing causal issues in, the, in other people, not in yourself, because remember we're talking about yourself, next talk, when it, the penalty for not addressing causal issues emotionally in other people is the effect on your soul is that you will actually finish up feeling tired and depleted and exhausted and you'll get sick, uh, physically sick probably as well. That's what will happen. It's been a major problem for me in my life because I used to get sick once a month, every month, on the average, for a week. Every, like I did that, that happened for nearly 15 years of my life. From the time I was 20 to the time I was 33, that happened. The instant I stopped doing it, I didn't get sick for seven years. <laughs> That's how different it was, like for my body. Just by trying to fix the effects of problems all around me <coughs> rather than addressing the causes. So very powerful when you change that for yourself. Notice also in the list there, we, we, we have the effect that others that we want to help or seem to help never change. So how many of you have had this kind of friend that like 20 years ago they had this problem and they've still got the same problem today and we're still helping them out in the same way that we did 20 years ago? Right. That's, that's a fair, right? So that's a fair thing to indicate to us that we're not dealing with the cause. Most of the time, we don't deal with the cause because we're afraid. We're afraid that we're going to lose a friendship, for example. Often that's the case. So, example of that. Let's say I've got a very strained relationship with my parents, right? If I deal with the effect, whenever I'm with my parents, I'll just make it easy for them by dodging this emotion inside of myself and dodging that emotion inside of it, not bring up anything. And what I'll do is not address anything with my parent directly. Why? Because I'm afraid that if I address them directly and actually tell them how I really feel about this situation, they're going to hate my guts and not give me the love that I'm seeking from them. Right? But the truth is, if I was dealing the, with the cause, I would actually want to deal with the cause within them that causes them to not love me. And the only way we can do that is by me telling the truth about the cause within me as to how I feel. Does that make sense? Teresa, thanks. Up there, just up over there. Um, in that situation where you've got a friend who's been talking to you for 20 years, I've, I've got a friend, my cousin like that. Um, does that mean she's actually giving me permission to say, well, actually, this is what I think, or, or whatever, so you're, um, you're not breaking the law of free will by saying, well, these are the causes, or... Most of the time, people who are doing this are just using you to escape their own emotions, all right? And it, whether they want you to or not, you're allowed to say, because of your own free will, that you are not going to do it anymore. And when you do that, it will certainly trigger whatever that emotion is that they're trying to get from you. Right? So my, my suggestion is to just be very firm about what you feel you will do. 
And when you do that, you will even do it in a loving way. You say, look, I just can't do this anymore with you because I'm not loving myself doing this when I'm with you. Right? And I can't not love myself anymore. You know, we've been in this cycle for 20 years. I don't want to continue the cycle another day. I'm not going to do this another day with you. Now, if that means losing our friendship, if that's, if that's, so, if that's what you want, then I'm going to lose your friendship. That's the way it's going to be. But unfortunately, or well, fortunately for me, <laughs> I am not going to do this unloving thing to you anymore or this unloving thing to myself. You see, you're being unloving to them as well as yourself by just addressing the effect. In fact, what you're often doing when you're addressing effects is you're enabling their own unloving conduct. You're actually helping them. It's like, you'll, hear, you'll understand it when we refer to it like with a child, a teenage child, let's say. Let's say a teenager has got a new car. Dad bought him a car, paid for the insurance, pays for the tyres, pays for everything. He gets in the car, you know, with a few mates, off he goes, and then, you know, Dad finds out he's been doing burns around the main highway. <laughs> this happens a lot in the country uh, still. And, and uh, you, know, you know, he's ripped up half the tyres. Now he wants new tyres. Dad says, oh, well, you know, yeah, all right, I'll buy you new tyres. You know, so he buys him new tyres. So what does he do again with those tyres? And then, and then he buys him new tyres. What's Dad doing? He's just feeding it, like feeding, feeding that issue, right? This is what we're often doing with others, is we're actually feeding or enabling their unloving behaviour towards themselves or others. We're often doing that. And, and we often continue doing that for years and years and years without saying anything because we're too afraid to say anything. So should we actually say something as well? Always. Yeah, so this is what, you know... You need but to do. deliver it, like work through your own emotions first. But yes, if you're not saying something in that situation, you do not love yourself. And we'll talk about that next week, or next fortnight or whatever it is, about you know, what we would do in treating ourselves with this law of cause and effect. Yep. Is there anything else that we need to mention in there? Oh, I've got a good one there. I'd just like to read it out. Notice in the example I've got, if a child is taking drugs, we would, number one, address emotions within ourselves of low self-worth that have been passed down to the child. So in other words, we would first look at our own feelings of self-worth or how we've treated the child for them to have such terrible self-worth and we'd work through all those emotions. Second, we'd talk to child about the emotions we've just worked through. So we're not telling the child, you've got this emotion, you've got that emotion, you've got this emotion. What we're doing instead is we're saying, I've got this emotion, I've got that, I've got this emotion, I can see that all of these emotions in me have created this in you. Then, we would never intervene with the effects happening to the child unless they were willing to address the cause. So the child gets picked up for drug selling, gets taken to, to, to the thing, goes to court, gets put in jail for three months. Would you pay for his court fees? You see, a lot of parents would, right? <coughs> but it wouldn't be loving because it, it would be addressing the effect. Can you see that? The child really needs to pay for the effect, not you. The child does. Right? And then dealing with the effects, bailing the person out, is actually an unloving act unless the person truly desires to change. Right? Can you see... All I'd be doing in that situation is enabling more drug-taking behaviour if I did anything else other than those things. You see? And so often what we do is we get so embroiled in the situation that we don't look at the cause. And it's a loving act for you to look at the causal emotion within another person and, in love, talk to them about what that causal emotion may be. It's a loving act to do that. It's not a loving act for you to actually talk about the effect and berate them for the effects they've created and judge them for the effects that they've created in their life because of what they've done. That's not loving. Which is often what we finish up doing. <laughs> right? Rather than addressing the cause. There's a, a lot of love in addressing a cause. And if you can help any single person address just one emotional cause, there's a beautiful effect for them in their life and also 
a very positive effect inside of you and your own soul as well. Right. Louisa, and um, up the back, thanks. Um, AJ, just um, with my older daughter, she's 29, um, she sometimes gets hysterical about things and I listen and I feel quite dumped on because I feel guilty that I haven't given her enough love in her life. So she gets hysterical? Well, yeah, and I... Talks to you, you feel down. Yeah. Guilty. So yeah. I kind of feed that because I'm feeling guilty that I haven't given her enough in her life. Um. Uh, it depends. Depends. Um, see, every situation can't, can't be said like to be the same for every single person because there's different sets of emotions going on. So yes, in some cases, I, I'm not saying this is your situation now. I'm just talking about situations generally. Like if, if a daughter gets hysterical and then you feel like tired listening to it, right? Then there's only two reasons why you feel tired listening to it. One is that you actually do feel like you are to blame and you're not allowing yourself to be repentant for that. In other words, to feel the sorrow you feel about that. And you're trying to suppress that emotion. So that's one option, right? The other option is that she, in her hysteria, is trying to get an emotion from you. And that you feel that you have to give it, and in the process you feel depleted in your energy. Right? Either one, there's an emotion inside of yourself to deal with, with regard to the relationship. But can you see that it might be different depending on what's going on inside of yourself? And would kind of addressing the cause be sort of encouraging her to talk with me about how she feels about our relationship? Or no. Not? Addressing the cause would firstly be you yeah. going away privately yeah. and working through your issues about what that felt like for you and working through repentance and remorse about you know, things you've done as a parent and so forth. That's firstly addressing the cause. When, when you do that, then the second things will start occurring. Now, Nina, you've had an experience of this with your daughter, haven't you? Like, both of you have had that experience. Um. Just many occasions now. One I did share with the group, but um, I think it was maybe a couple of weeks ago. My daughter has gone through a very challenging time, and um, I wanted to fix her, I guess, and I wanted to help her. And so you had all this projected emotion of fear, really, going at her, trying to fix her. And, and I think it was mixed with guilt. I relate to what the okay. other lady was saying. And yep. I got to a point where I had this, and I don't know how I got to that point, but there was this feeling of, oh, God, I just don't want to fix her anymore. I just want to love her. I right. just wanted to love her. There was nothing that I wanted to do. I just wanted to love her with in this way that I hadn't quite felt before. Yep. And I, that happened for me on a Monday and I didn't express it to anyone, but my daughter and I are very, very close and connected somehow. And she's incredibly intuitive. And she rang me up on the Wednesday and she said, Mum, what are you doing now? Because she knows I've been doing this. What are you doing now? Are you praying for me or something? And I said, no, love, I'm doing exactly the opposite. I've just completely given up. <laughs> and I've given it to God. And it was really beautiful and over the period of months that I've been doing this work on myself and I have felt a lot of repentance and I've never done anything abusive, our relationship is just blossoming and it's the most precious, beautiful thing I can think so of. So what's ever. happening is it's drawing her to you and she expresses herself automatically to you now because she hasn't got that huge projection coming from you that she has to do it anymore. Yeah, and I'm really starting to feel that she cares for me, which is something I've never felt from her before. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's so precious. If I could somehow convey for a parent to, to walk this road, I really would, because yeah. it's very, very special. Yeah. So does that give you sort of an illustration of, oftentimes as parents, what we're trying to do is we're trying to fix the child, but actually we're not understanding. We don't understand if we're trying to do that. The child's, all the child's problems are the result of something that's inside of me that I need to fix. And when I fix that, everything will be drawn. The child will be drawn back to me and will also be drawn back in the relationship and become closer in the relationship in order to deal with those problems. That will happen automatically. 
if I deal with what's going on inside of me. So in your case, Nina, there was a projection sort of harming her free will. She was allowed to choose what she wants to choose. There was also a projection in terms of your desire didn't match her desire. There was also a projection of not addressing the cause within yourself, which you started to address once you started to address. You can see how it all effects. And then you did all this automatically when you just let go of the whole process and said, all right, I'm just going to love her no matter what goes on. <coughs> now she's not getting all those projections anymore. That was the other really profound thing. She said, the reason that she was ringing me up and asking me what I was doing is she has been suffering from anxiety and she said, Mum, for the last two days I've been feeling less anxious. Yep. So here's me thinking, oh, I'd like to help her. I've got to, you know, I want to be there for her. I want to help her fix this. But I was just making her anxious, including myself. Exactly. So your own anxiety was being projected upon her, which making her feel more anxious and so forth. And so it's very, very powerful when you actually change it at the soul level, what's going on towards the children. Josh? Um, I was wondering um, what your suggestion would be if you're on the receiving end of of someone, like if you're reliant on someone's giving to you, um, what's the best way to can, like I, I find with emotions a lot of the time emotion will come up by confronting the person but I'm also afraid of projecting at them in that situation. So just say someone's giving a lot of things to you all the time and you can see that it's coming from some sort of erroneous place um, but you're relying on that then you're in disharmony with love. I would instantly say to them, I'm sorry, but I can see that you're giving it and it's not coming from love, so I can't receive it even though I need it. And so if there's a lot of anger tied in with that and you're, con you're confronting the person, it's like you, do, you have to run away before you even say anything. <laughs> And if you're getting anger from the other person, then address that too. Why are you angry with me now for, for knocking back something that's a gift? If it was a gift, you wouldn't be angry with me. And that would actually confront the underlying emotion as to what you were feeling in the first place anyway. So, so the, the truth is, Josh, that in the end, if somebody's giving something to you and you know they're not doing it out of love, they're doing it out of guilt, shame, whatever it is, your accepting it is actually breaking a law of love whether you need that thing or not. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And then the question you need to ask yourself is, all right, I'm obviously accepting it, thinking I'm not going to get it from any other location. <laughs> so therefore, my issue is a lack of abundance and so forth, an emotion that I need to work my way through. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. So allow yourself to uh, see that whenever, whenever you notice another person doing something that they don't really desire to do, then you are actually harming them by accepting them doing it to you. Do, do you follow me? And let, uh, if you address the issue, then you'll find that everything will become more harmonious with love. Mary, I can feel Mary's projecting at me about our own situation in this one. <laughs> do you want to say something about it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm feeling it. <laughs> I was just marvelling at my soulmate because you actually really do this. And when we first started a relationship, it was really challenging for me because I had a lot of pleasing people emotions. And so I was doing a lot of things that were actually what I thought would be pleasing AJ. And because he's so sensitive, he would be saying to me, you don't actually want to do this. We're not doing this. You, no, no, you can't do it. And so yeah. I was just... Um, and what has that helped you do? Like, it's helped you... Well, look at my, what my own desires are because I was someone who was completely, um, well, very out of touch with what my true passions and desires were. Um, because if, of it. if it was in any way impinging on anyone else, what I felt other people want, wanted, I wouldn't allow myself to You'd have You'd automatically do what they wanted. Yeah. 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 And Mary was so sensitive that she could feel what I wanted and automatically try to do it. And then I would feel... She's trying to do it. She doesn't really want it. So <laughs> you have two really sensitive people. Yeah. So, so, and that just helps confront the fact that you know that it, what's happening with the desire. Does that make sense? So let yourself do that. And and if somebody is trying to give something to you and you feel the desire to do it is not based on love but it's based on 
And a lot of times people will give to you because they want something from you. Right? And this happens to myself and Mary quite often, actually, where people do give us things, but they want our time in return. So it's not, it's not a gift anymore, right? We have to pay for it. And so um, you know, usually what we try to do is reject those kind of transactions. Right? Because obviously that's not a gift, that's an expectation. And that's not a loving thing. Even if we need the thing that we're being given. Mm. Thanks, mate. Um, Jen, just over there. If there's, yep, I had an done. experience in my sleep state last night. Um, some people were telling me I wasn't allowed to talk to God. Now, obviously, that's a fear of mine that I'm not supposed to be talking to God. Mm -hmm. But they kept on and on and on, and I got very, very angry. And I noticed there was a broomstick over in the corner and they wouldn't leave. They said, we're not leaving until you say you're not going to talk to God anymore. Yep. So I started whacking them with this broomstick. <laughs> yep. Now I have two questions. Yep. Is that going to affect my soul condition because <laughs> I've been whacking these people? Um, or was that, um, you know, I felt like I was really being attacked. So... Yeah, so, so there's a few emotions for you to work through. When you're being attacked, the feeling of you being attacked, you wish to attack in return, right? So if you wish to attack in return when you're being attacked, then you need to look at the emotion or the underlying emotion that's there, what's driving that. Now often it's an emotion of like feeling like not being listened to or not being heard. Sometimes it's an emotion of feeling controlled and wanting to burst out of that control. And there's other types of emotions. That your better option would be to go into those emotions and feel them so that you don't feel like attacking the other person. And the irony is that when you deal with the causal emotion, you will be attacked less or not at all because your law of attraction changes and nobody feels they can attack you and get away with it. Does that make sense? And so they no longer attack you as much. So I've, I've, I've uh, said to you in the past that I've had often like large groups of people or, or groups of people attacking me, uh, some being very threatening and some even threatening to kill me. Um, and, and once I've dealt with my own emotion, they've just, they're still there and they still have the same anger towards me, but they don't, feel, they don't do that to me anymore. So just by my dealing with my own emotion that attracted that. And we'll talk about the law of attraction in a minute as another, as another law. Mike's coming across there. So why in the first century did, it, did you still get crucified? Um, I've, ha I've answered that question before, um, so I probably don't want to answer it again. It's in one of the DVDs. Basically it's about choices that I made rather than um, uh, which, which were caused by my desire to teach truth um, rather than and the choices of other people which I allowed to occur so I made the choice of allowing them to occur I could have got out of them but I allowed them to occur yeah. in, in an act of love to help them see what they were doing and it involved many people like involved, involved many of our f friends who uh, who were following me and so forth in terms of what was their real soul condition and what was going on inside of themselves, which I'd tried to address on many occasions. And it also involved the soul condition of the Pharisees and the soul condition of the Sanhedrin and the soul condition of the Roman, certain Roman, uh, you know, Pilate and certain other Romans, and also the soul condition of some of the soldiers who were, who were people who I actually knew. So it involved quite a lot of different things. And, uh, and as a result of that, I wanted to address all of those things emotionally with all of them. Yeah. Big pause on that one. <laughs> um, people understand that. Do you understand that? Like, there's, a lot, there's a lot of things that went on in my death in the first century, which are not documented, obviously, now. And, and there's this constant viewpoint that, like, that I died for the world in some way. The truth is that um, I made a lot of choices in a, in a very short period of time, in a period of a one, one or two hours. I made a lot of choices based around all of the different things that were going on. And, and I based all of those choices that I made on my love for them. And the result was that I died, 
but, uh, but it was a, and I knew that I would in making those choices because I knew their condition. But, but I didn't see any other way to teach them the truth of love that I was trying to teach them. So we will talk much more about that at another time perhaps uh, when myself and Mary answer some questions about our own life together perhaps. I was just feeling that the, the effect of your loving decision at that time has then resonated through 2,000 years. That's right. And affected literally billions of people since that time. Yes. Yeah. And I had, a, I had a sense that that would probably be the case too. Because um, because by this stage I also had the sense that of what you were doing when you were growing your own soul condition. You were creating universal spaces. You were creating new dimensions and so forth. And I'd already had the experience of entering three or four of those. So I understood. I understood the the feelings involved and what changes that will occur to the entire human race through the actions that I was taking. So there were a lot of things that factored in the decisions that I was making at the time. Yeah. All right. What's the next one? Law of Attraction. Law of Attraction. Now we've talked a lot about Law of Attraction, right? Haven't we? We've done a few presentations about it. Let's just write it down. Remember I said to you in our talk about the Law of Attraction that the Law of Attraction was God's messenger to you of what the truth is about your own soul condition. Because remember, the law of attraction works upon your soul condition. It works upon the real condition of your soul. So if that's the case, then, then it's God's messenger of truth to you, through all the other laws in operation, of what the true condition of your soul is. Now, if I'm living in harmony with this in my relationship with others, what would I do with others? Firstly, if I'm attracting a series of events where other people are treating me in a hurtful manner, I will not blame all of them for their stupid and erroneous condition. I will instead see that the law of attraction is based on my soul condition and I will focus on the emotions inside of myself that created this attraction. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, Graham, where is Graham at the moment? Ah, you had a very good example last week about this with your cab fares and stuff last fortnight. Do you want to just relate some of that? Um, I had two uh, people, like I'm a cab driver, and had two people con me into thinking that they were going to pay me. And um, I've never had that happen in the two and a half years I've been cab driving. And were they quite substantial fares or? Yeah, yep. one was a $20 fare and the other was 45 Right. And um, I felt they were coming back, that, that, that she would give me a ring and, and organise it and that he would come back out again and, and things like that. So it was a male and a female? A male and a so female. So different gender? Yeah. And uh, I was really surprised with myself that I hadn't seen it firstly. Yep. Um, and then the fact that it happened two nights in a row and it had never happened before, that just sort of blew me away. Yep. And th it brought up all sorts of emotions with respect to trusting people and, uh, and stuff like that. And, and, and it came in uh, with the mediumship homework and trust for AJ and, and so all sorts of stuff came up. So what it triggered in you emotionally was this issue of trust of others and you owned those emotions like you instead of sort of getting angry with them did, so initially did you get angry with them or no no, no. So I, was, I was just so amazed really that yep. I, that firstly that I hadn't seen it and it, yeah there was no anger it was just I was stunned so you were amazed that your law of attraction had brought you two events in a row that you'd never had before yeah. that all of a sudden you had an emotion that, that you could have work yeah. through about it yeah, yeah. and and Sometime after the second one, like the the funny thing is, is that the way the the um, the cab company organises things is when somebody does a runner, the cab driver effectively has to pay the company, still has to pay the company their share of the fare of the fare, which feels very unfair, doesn't it? Like yeah, for most of you, that felt yeah. unfair. And, <laughs> yeah. and 
And in the past, I've actually brought it up with the general manager of the company. Yeah. And um, he was nice about it, but said, no, well, this is the policy, and we're going to stick with that. Yeah. And I've had issues with, like, other cab drivers. I've asked other cab drivers, and, and they've said, oh, we just do cashies, you know, we just... Because we get people all the time offering to do cashies, yeah. you know, because you give them a bit of a discount.